Hello everybody, my name is Rob Nixon and welcome to this very special webinar which is getting you ready for tax season. Now uh, you may or may not uh, know me, uh, I'm privileged to present this webinar with two colleagues of mine today and, uh, and just a quick background on, on where I'm coming from. Uh, 19 years ago, May 1994, I started working with accounting firms. And I started working with accounting firms in Australia. Since then, I've worked with accounting firms in seven countries, the United States, Canada, UK, etc. And uh, it took me 18 years to write a book about the industry, Accounting Practices Don't Add Up. Uh, and uh, that's been uh, sold in our 38, 39 countries, I believe. And uh, you can sort of check more about me at robnixon.com or proactiveaccountants.net. So I'm joined today uh, by also my colleague and business partner, Colin Dunn. Colin, are you there? I'm here, Rob. Uh, delighted to be here today. And Colin, uh, you are an accountant. Give us a quick background on you. Yeah, I certainly am, Rob. So uh, I spent uh, close to 10 years with uh, one of the fastest growing accounting firms in the United Kingdom. and. Uh, since then, uh, around about 15 years now, uh, working with accounting firms around the world in a, in a coaching, training, and consulting capacity. So, uh, uh, as I say, I'm very pleased to be with you on the webinar today, Rob. And uh, your book just came out last year as well, Cole? Yeah, that's right. So my book's all about uh, how accountants are, I believe, as I know you do too, are the natural trusted advisor. And so uh, really all about uh, how can accountants offer value-added services to their clients. Excellent. Thank you, Cole. I'll come back to you very soon. Also joined today is Steve Moss. Uh, Steve is a partner in an accounting firm called Holden Moss. And Steve um, has been working with us now for the last, uh, what do we call it, so 15 months, Steve, thereabouts? That's correct, Rob. Thank you. Yep. And, uh, and Steve has an awesome story to tell regarding last year's tax season. And we thought we'd bring him onto this webinar uh, for you to get ready for your tax season coming up. Uh, because Steve um, got a lot of these ideas like about 18 months ago and implemented them and made some changes. So, uh, Steve, if you can just give a quick summary on the different what you implemented 12 months ago or 15 months ago and what happened as a result of your tax season last year. Sure. Um, last fall, uh, my wife and I found out that we were going to have a grandchild. We were excited about that, but unfortunately we also found out that he had a very severe heart defect. Um, my son or either his wife was going to have to quit work. They potentially would lose their homes. So Karen and I decided that we would set up home away from our home to take care of this grandson. And Karen was going to devote her full time to doing that. So this all came about in January, right before tax season, when we made this decision. and. I really needed to make some changes because I, my family needed me desperately. So I had read Rob's book back earlier in the year and just like most everything else, you read it, put it down and I didn't do anything with it. So I decided I'd pick the book back up and I extracted out of it I guess about a half dozen items that I implemented um, during tax season. And what happened as a result, because um, this was, you told me privately about your 20th or 25th tax season or something like that, Steve, was that correct? Yeah, and we'll say 25 plus, Rob. <laughs> 20, we'll just go with 25 plus, we'll go with that. So what were the, when you implemented those half dozen ideas and the many, many more ideas in the content that we've got, you know, hundreds of different ideas, when you implement those half dozen ideas, what happened as a result of doing that? Well, first and foremost, it freed up a substantial amount of my time so that for someone who typically worked six, six and a half days a week, I was able to leave early most Fridays to go be with my wife over the weekend. Um, I didn't have to work over the weekends. That was the biggest thing. And I was able to focus more on the most important clients that I had instead of being divided amongst every client. It allowed me to focus. For the team, I um, was able to push more complex work down to them. 
um, and they really enjoyed that. They enjoyed the challenge of it. They were great at accepting the challenge, and it just created a, a great level of camaraderie and working together around the office. Uh, one of the key things, success items, was a, criti uh, a client um, um, communication coordinator that we put in as a new job that you all recommend, Rob, and that helped us totally with changing the turnaround time on our jobs. Clients were happier with the turnaround time. We implemented a budget system where we budgeted the time. We tracked jobs, where they were within the office. So it was just overall a very smooth year. We were more profitable on these clients. The time went down. Um, and so it, it just worked out marvelously, Rob. really did. And at the end of the day, you, you, you got more profit in tax season when you did this, and you picked up two days like the weekend, which previously you, you didn't have before. That's correct. In tax season. It's unbelievable. So what we're going to do now that we've got you've got time to implement these ideas um, um, and also we've now put this together into a package so that you can really you know implement this a lot faster and maybe not just half a dozen ideas like Steve did, but maybe you might implement 10 or a dozen ideas pre-tax season. So here we go. We've got um, a situation coming up. It happens every single year. Tax time in the United States, uh, this crazy manic time. And you've got two choices um, from today's webinar. You can either go down the path of the way it's been, which is uh, typically long hours, drowned in paper, uh, very, very busy, like Steve had for his 25 plus years uh, prior. Or you can do it in a more orderly fashion uh, for your, um, in your firm. So just as we get going, you'll notice on your panel, on the, uh, on the webinar panel, there's a little hand signal there. If you could just hit your hand signal, just to make sure you can hear us today, and then uh, we've got a series of questions I'm going to ask you, so we're going to make this interactive as possible. You'll see on the bottom of your um, panel, there's a chat session. Uh, when I ask a question uh, of, of the audience, we've got hundreds and hundreds of people listening in, to, in today. Uh, if you could uh, just put a, a note down there. Uh, in response to the question. So first of all, hand signal. Uh, I'll get one of my uh, moderators to make sure we can all hear, you can all hear us. So I just hit the hand signal to say, yes, we can hear you, and, uh, and we'll get going. So two choices. Either, uh, great, fantastic, thank you for the moderator, Sonia. Uh, two choices. You can either go the way that you've been doing, or you can make some changes like what Steve did, and maybe get a couple of days a week of your life back and make some profits, or maybe you do something more significant. What we're going to do is make a promise. We're going to make a promise um, as a result of this webinar. It'll be under an hour. Uh, we finish in 50, 55 minutes or so. And the promise is that by the end of it, you will have the ability to implement what Steve was talking about a moment ago and more to get a dramatic uh, difference at your tax time uh, coming up. So let's have a look at a couple of things, first of all, and put this in some context with some numbers. Here we have some uh, industry results, and industry results uh, generated via the MAP survey and via the popular um, survey that comes out once a year, and also by our uh, firms that implement uh, what we ask you to do. So a few changes. First of all, uh, utilization. Uh, industry average is about 66% for the year. Our members average 76%, so a 15% difference when they implement these ideas. I'm going to do a big build-up here um, so that you, know, you actually take it on board because all of what we're talking about here has been written by accountants for accountants. All of the content has come in from, you know, when Steve implements an idea and it's a bit different from someone else's that's been implemented, we will take that on and modify to suit. You know, so it's coming from the field of successful firms like Steve's. And Steve, uh, just back to you, uh, your size of your firm, you're running about 25, 30 people at the moment? That's correct. And, and uh, is it two, two partners you've got? Three total. Three, three partners, 25 people, so typical size firm. Uh, one of the things that we like to measure is utilization of the partners, and the industry average is about 50%. 50%. Our firms that we work at 37%, it's actually better, because we're a big... Uh, big focus we have 
on pushing partner time down, not more chargeable time for partners, but more profitability up. Uh, realization percentage, you know, 88% uh, where our firms are getting 101% up to 134%, so which means they're writing up, not writing down. And the only way you can do that is if you price projects in advance and drive the time down. So a uh, big change there in realization, you know, it's very hard to have write-ups or higher realization when you price in arrears. Uh, days of work in progress and accounts receivable, you know, the industry average 105, hours of 63, um, you know, a plus 67 day difference, a plus 67 percent difference, I missed, missed the percentage there. And then the net firm billing rate, which will flow through your profitability, average $135, hours 176, plus 30. So you can see that when you implement some simple ideas that would make a profound uh, impact on your firm. So the question I have for you first up is what is your tax time typically like? You know, just answer in a couple of words in your chat um, and, and, and my moderator uh, Sonia will send me through some words. So what is your tax time typically like? Maybe it's one or two words uh, that, that signifies what it's like um, throughout that uh, period of time. So let's get into it and let's have a look at a very simple formula on how we are going to actually uh, get a much higher success rate in tax time. And we've thought long and hard about this and working with firms like Steve's. So, so, so what is it? What's going to make the difference? Barely controlled chaos, I love that. What's going to make the difference in tax time success? Three things. Uh, your whole workflow process, the workflow process from um, raw materials in to finished product out and launched. Efficiency, so the efficiency whilst it's in the shop, how fast you get the job done, uh, you know, whilst it's in the, in, the, in the shop. And lastly, pricing, you know, actually how you price that project, that job up front, uh, so it all makes sense uh, to drive profitability and capacity. So we're talking about um, uh, some changes that you need to make uh, in your business. So let's focus on these three areas. That's essentially the topic of our webinar today, workflow efficiency and pricing. Insane and hectic is another one. Look at that. Uh, here they're coming through now. So clearly it's, um, it's, it's hectic, great, all right? So uh, uh, someone says tax time is great. Must have been someone having a joke. I'm not too sure about that one. So <laughs> let's have a look at these three areas. Let's start with workflow. Often workflow is like this. Workflow, piles of paper, piles of files, um, very, very busy, lots of work in progress uh, happening. Steve, give us a description of what workflow used to be like pre-implementing these ideas with you. We were really ignorant of how far behind or not we were. We weren't allocating jobs properly. Turnaround time was all over the place on all of the jobs. It wasn't chaos, but it wasn't far from it. Okay. And Cole, you, you are an accountant and you coach accountants these days. How would you describe most workflow systems in an accounting firm? That's a great question, Rob. I think the best way to describe it is that uh, the client typically controls the workflow rather than the accounting firm controlling the workflow. And so what I mean by that is clients bring in their materials, bring in, bring in their records when it suits them. Uh, rather than the accountant scheduling the work so that it suits the accounting firm uh, and that way uh, you know both the accounting firm wins but also the clients win as well because as Steve uh, alluded to there it's much easier to turn things around in a, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner if you're in control of that process. So I liken workflow to this here, a manufacturing process. And uh, no matter which manufacturing process you look at, a manufacturing process is a step-by-step -step sequence of events that either goes through robots or hands, and eventually, when it gets to the end of the assembly line, the product is built. So as we look at workflow, and think of it this way, uh, think of it as a process. You know, raw materials in, um, we do some work around that, we answer queries with clients, we um, bring it back, we finish it off, we review it, and then we get it out the door. So what we designed here is an 18-step workflow process, so 18 key steps. 
And by the way, um, you can uh, have a look at this system on toolkitsforaccountants.com. But 18 sequential steps that when you implement workflow in this manner, uh, a step of processes, then you get far more efficient. In fact, you get so, so efficient, you typically run out of work. You know, what Steve experienced in that tax time last 12 months, 12 months ago, was by implementing not all these ideas, and Steve, I'd like you to talk about which ones you actually did implement in a moment, uh, didn't implement all of these ideas, but implemented enough so we could free up two days of capacity um, in the firm, which was just two days of Steve's capacity. Now, what we find is when you implement all of these ideas, you, you, you free up the whole firm and you free up all the capacity to the point of about 20% of the entire firm's capacity is freed up, which means you end up doing your annual work in about nine or 10 months, not 12 months, so, which means you've got more opportunity to really help your clients. So a sequential step of process, scheduling the work in advance, which means send the calendar out, meet with client to scope out what we're going to do. Now, with this close to tax season, you may not be implementing all of these, but we're going to talk about which one Steve did implement in a moment. You know, value price to job, so communicating the writing in advance. Client signs off on the scope. Uh, so before you get started, you've actually down to point four here. Uh, client has signed off, knows exactly what they're going to be doing. Uh, send a checklist, gather all materials, check everything's being received, contact the client for misinformation. Before we get started, we are building up all the raw materials here. Log the job into electronic and visual workflow system. Do an, a team budget and hours. Uh, Set the electronic work papers. Uh, challenge the hours budget, drive time down, allocate and explain the job, do the job and find any automated opportunities, communicate any technical queries to the client, finish it off, review the job, print, collect, bind, prepare invoice file, meet with the client, present the job, and ask for a referral. Steve, I know you're implementing this in full this year, but what did you implement of this last year, Steve? Oh, we began with logging in the jobs into our electronic workflow system um, to keep track of it, but the big one was drafting the internal budget. Uh, the client service coordinator would draft that budget and then she would also challenge the budget compared to the prior year. And then she would allocate the job out. She would also, and I delegated down to team members, item 14. Partners and key managers in a firm t tend to be bottlenecks. And we also tend to do most of the communication with clients. And so I pulled myself out of that loop. And I let the team deal directly with the clients instead of I doing that. And that was one of the biggest time savers of all. And it was also a joy for the team. They wanted to communicate with the clients more. That in the client service coordinator. But that client service coordinator role was critical because um, that pulled time off of the team members, administrative time off the team members, that I was able to then take off of me and push down to them. So it's kind of a domino effect. Um, worked beautifully, though. And this year, Steve, you said to us just off, um, off the webinar that you're actually going to be implementing this in its entirety this year. That's correct. We're working through it all, um, getting team buy-in as to what the process is, how we're going to implement it directly within our offices, and absolutely, yep. Now, you mentioned about the client service coordinator. So just for everyone listening in, this is an administrative function. Uh, we've surveyed accountants, done time and motion type studies with accountants, and we worked out they spend an hour and a half to two hours per accountant per day doing administrative tasks. And typically, it's tasks um, from here uh, five, uh, through to uh, 12, you know, the, that gathering, gathering of information and the preparation, um, you know, of work papers, et cetera. So Steve, you hired, um, how many client service coordinators did you hire last year? She worked with approximately 1,000 clients. And, but, uh, but, that would, and, but how many accountants did she work for? Because you hired Oh, one accountants. Person, um, yeah. Seven. Seven. Yes. So, so, so the, the, the whole process was not through the whole firm because you've got 25 people there. Correct. Uh, and that's about the ratio, one to five, one to seven, 
um, administrative people to actually do the administrative tasks associated with the accounting job. And, and really, you know, you've done that a year ago, Steve. Now, what would happen if you did the whole thing? You know, what are you hoping this tax season uh, is going to happen? Well, it will automatically go much more smoothly and the clients will be so much happier because um, they're going to get better service and that's the end result. That's our focus this year is to focus on the level of service we're giving our clients. Awesome. Now, uh, Cole, you mentioned something earlier and Alexandria uh, Alex has asked a question. Uh, about you scheduling the time to work on the files rather than the client. Can you just elaborate on that, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's exactly what you should do. So uh, rather than waiting for the client to bring the work in, what would happen if you went through your entire client list and uh, told the client in advance, this is when we want the work in. Now, you may not do that to the day, uh, but you know we have firms who will say to clients, we would like your work in in this particular week or in this particular month and that way you can schedule your work uh, around that uh, and uh, what a lot of firms do Rob is uh, they will prioritize the A-class clients and uh, in fact there's one firm uh, here, here, here in Australia who told us just recently uh, that as part of their communication schedule for their A-class clients, their premium clients, they say to them we're scheduling the work with all of the clients but as you're an class clients will, will allow you to choose the week that you're going to bring the work in. And so as you see on the screen right there, point one in the 18-step workflow process that Steve said uh, he's going to implement this year in its entirety is schedule the work in advance. That's you, not the client, scheduling the work. Awesome. So question I have for everyone when it, when it comes to workflow. If we were to implement, you know, even just part of this 12 months ago like Steve did or the full um, full version that Steve's put in this year, because now, now that Steve's got a hold of our workflow you know, uh, toolkit, which you didn't have last year, uh, it's going to make it much easier for, for you. What difference, when it's a question for everyone, if you were to implement this, what difference would it make to have a systematic manufacturing type process for your com compilation compliance end of year work? What difference would it make to your firm? If you can answer that, that would be fantastic in the chat bar, and we'll see what differences this is going to make to you. So workflow is vitally important, you know, the throughput of work. Whilst the work's getting done, though, we need to focus on efficiency. And efficiency is all about uh, doing what it needs to be done in the optimum time possible. And ideally, that means less time. Now, <laughs> less time possible uh, is, is not an incentive if you price the project in arrears. Uh, but if you price the project in advance and you communicate that with the client to say it will be $5,000, then you are incentivized to do it in the least amount of time possible or the most efficient way. Of course, if you price in, in arrears, then if you, um, if you don't do this, then what's going to happen, uh, if, you do, if, you, if you price in arrears and you are efficient, you're going to make less money. But you'll still be efficient. So we want you to price up front and we want you to drive time down as well. So in your firm, what's the hardest part about achieving high efficiency levels and fast throughput? Where are the bottlenecks? You know, more productivity and less stress is one of the answers I got from before, which is fantastic. But where are the bottlenecks in your firm? If you could just put in, you know, um, what are these bottlenecks to be efficient? Now, we are going to price up front, so now we're going to look at bottlenecks. What is it? What's going to be the bottleneck that you've currently got to get the work out, have far less time on the job? Uh, Deborah says it would be huge. I agree with you, Deborah, uh, to get, make this happen. Allow me to do the money-making work. Allow me to do the money-making work and not get bogged down with the other stuff. I understand uh, what you're saying there. You've typed that rather quickly. So what's the hardest part about with you achieving high efficiency levels and fast throughput in your firm? Um, what are your current bottlenecks? Thank you, Sonia. Uh, what are your current bottlenecks? And then secondly, how much does this cost you not to sort this out? You know, because if you've got bottlenecks on throughput with efficiency, you know, in Steve's case, he sorted it out and got two days personally uh, per week during, during tax time. You know, so for him not to do it, 
Uh, Steve, what would if you didn't do that, Steve? Let's just look back twelve months, Steve. Uh, if you didn't do that, what would have been the impact? Oh, the personal consequences would have been incredible. It would have been intolerable for me not to be able to support my family and to be there when my family needed me. Intolerable. So for you, you just had to do this? Yes. So maybe you do as well. So to get more efficient, we have got a workflow process going on. To get more efficient, there are just three things to focus on. And if you think about these three things, and you get super, super efficient with these three areas, you will take time out of jobs. Most accountants we meet, and that's all we work with, thousands of accountants around the world, you know, we interact with accountants every day, you know, through our forum, chat forum, or through our products, through our coaching, through our technology, whatever method we've got. And we find that the ones that are super efficient are focused on three things, and that's people, equipment, and policy, and processes. So what does that mean? Well, people like Steve was talking about, and the, the, the easy is the efficiency zone here. People like the right people doing the right jobs. Having suitable volumes of administrative people uh, to make sure that the administrative tasks are being handled by administrative people. You know, equipment, you know, making sure you've got two or three computer screens in every desk. You've got the tools they need uh, to be efficient in process. You know, if you haven't got two screens on a desk, which, you know, I, I, heaven forbid you haven't got two, you know, then it, putting two screens on, proven you'll be 25% more efficient. So if you put three screens on, you'll be efficient again. If you've got the desk space, you may need a bigger desk. And then policy and systems, part of what Colin was talking about earlier, which is setting the rules. Say, these are the rules of the game. You will bring your work in this. Here's the checklist you have to fill it. You'll pay us now. So these three areas are critical to get firing to be super, super efficient. Cole, what's your take on some of the firms you've been coaching uh, regarding bottlenecks and efficiency areas around these three areas? Okay, so uh, I think most bottlenecks are created uh, because of what we were talking about before, uh, the accountant not, con not con taking control of the workflow. But what tends to happen, Rob, uh, is that uh, as accountants, we start the work for the client before we have all of the information that we need. And the deleterious effect of that, of course, is that you get started with a job and uh, you get a part of the way through it and then you find you've got some missing information. Uh, what that means is you need to put the job down again, call the client, the client says, yeah, sure, I'll get that in for you. Uh, but uh, they then get busy and they don't get it in. And so we're playing telephone tag, we're going back and forth with the client to get the information that we need. Uh, in the meantime, we pick up another job, same thing happens. And so most firms have so many open jobs and are closed enough jobs and then what can tend to happen is because we, we start to reach deadlines all of the information comes in at once and that's where you get major major bottlenecks uh, I think uh, also you know uh, the, the, just to uh, touch on a couple of the questions that have come through uh, Elizabeth uh, made an observation there saying clients think we've got all the time in the world to speak with them without charging them and that's really difficult because we focus on quality customer service and sometimes it's just so much. And Steve, I know one of the things that you did was to make a decision around those clients whom you would interview versus those for whom you would do the work uh, without them being present. Is that right? That's exactly right. And so my A clients um, I scheduled and had interviews with them, but the other clients were given the option of meeting with someone else or encouraged to drop off their information. That's correct. I was the bottleneck, partners of the bottlenecks, and if we're willing to delegate and train and trust our team, they can do a world of good for us, but that willingness or finding the necessity to delegate is a big problem. Steve, what are some of the things you've put in place now that you are 18 months down this track? You know, you, you picked up the book first of all, uh, then you implemented a half dozen ideas out of that, you, you got your two days per uh, week back for tax season. You've had another best part of a year. Uh, you even flew out to Australia to see us, which was just beautiful to spend that time with you and, and, and then you've implemented some other things since then. What, on efficiency, what are some other things that you've implemented um, to, to be efficient in your firm in the last eight, eight, 12 months? 
Well, um, probably the best thing we've worked through has been uh, the quarterly planning. We've we've developed and are implementing January 1st, our first quarterly planning. Um, one page strategic plan is what um, you call it. And um, we have focused priorities that we're working on. Um, five, as a matter of fact, which is probably too, too many than you would recommend, right? And um, But we've involved the team in setting priorities that will match up with what our firm priorities for the quarter. But as I said, our overall priority is to focus on making sure we provide the proper level of service to our existing clients, um, and certainly we'll work with new clients, but the focus on efficiency is to continue this client service coordinator role to um, allow our team members who are producers to do more productive work instead of administrative work, take that work off of them. And, the, and it has already created additional time. We're working through um, with our clients on monitoring engagements, um, the software that you have on your system, um, proactive success system for the clients so that we can really work with them on the numbers, do the important things that they want done instead of just wasting our time on busy work. I rambled a bit. I apologize. Uh, no, Steve, please. Um, and it's interesting about the quarterly process when it comes to efficiency. Um, we've had a lot of accounting firms um, when it comes to being efficient have had a theme for their quarter being speed. You know, so uh, and, and gone as far as dressing the office up like the movie Speed, you know, with Sandra Bullock and uh, uh, whoever else was in there uh, uh, with the bus and that sort of thing. So our focus this quarter is speed to get these jobs in and out in the most efficient way possible. Uh, theme, I like that. Our theme this quarter is the right stuff, and we're wanting everyone to be working on the right things at the right price, the right amount of time. I like that. I like that a lot. So efficiency is all about you know making sure the right people are doing the right things, the right equipment, the right tools for them, and the right policies. If you get two out of three of these right, don't expect to be fully efficient. If you get all three right, then you'll certainly get super efficient. Um, you know, certainly Steve's got this. We've put together a quick pack you know, a um, very detailed pack with interviewing a lot of firms on, you know, efficiency learning system, you know, DVD learning system with workbook, uh, you've got checklists on what accountants do with their time, strategies to get the right people doing the right things, position descriptions like what Steve was talking about, the client service coordinator, uh, some sample job advertisements so to hire these people, efficiency questionnaire to see how efficient you are, and a list of equipment you need to be more efficient. So. Um, uh, that's been made available uh, on toolkitforaccountants.com. Uh, something you can pick up straight away as a, as a product and get your team involved in this process. Because Steve, I'd imagine uh, that the, the more you've had your team involved, the easier this process would be. Would that be fair to say? And their enjoyment of what they do and feeling involved is dramatically increased. Awesome. So you've got workflow, you've got efficiency, and lastly we've got pricing. So pricing, how do we get to the right price? And we call this pricing power, uh, it's something we've been working on for a long, long time. And to get to the ideal price, Einstein said it well, which is your personal value belief plus your value contribution plus your value perception equals the ideal price. Uh, and, and it starts with you. I'm going to take you through some process in a moment on how you actually improve your price, uh, but unless you've got belief yourself that this is worth more or worth what it is, unless you understand the contribution you're making and then you put it across to your clients in such a way where their perception is very high, uh, you won't have their ideal price. We are selling professional services here. We're selling what we know. And you're, you're all professionals, you all can add tremendous value to your clients and charging by the hour is not a way to get the ideal price. You must charge in different ways and you must price the project, get clients sign off before you start.
for all this to make sense. Otherwise, you'll get a little bit of improvement, but not the major improvement. So, Cole, what do you see, uh, you know, as we coach accountants, what do you see when it comes to these three areas and getting to the right price, or the ideal price uh, with accountants? Okay, so uh, I think, uh, firstly, most accounts overthink uh, the, the, the entire uh, issue of pricing. And uh, what I mean by that uh, is when we say to accountants, before they get into this uh, whole concept of pricing up front, uh, you should price every job uh, in advance before you start the work. The most common pushback that I hear is, well, we don't know how long it's going to take to do that, therefore we can't give a price. My experience, Rob, is that uh, with most clients, not all, but with most, uh, you, if you look back the last three, four years, it's pretty much the same job. And so uh, let's not overthink this. Let's just pick a number uh, that, uh, that uh, you know will give you a good margin uh, and then communicate that to the client before you start the work. And that does several things. So number one, um, it gets you very, very focused on driving the time down on the job. So in other words, because you've, uh, you've committed to a price up front, you're now incentivized to do the job in less time. Uh, number two, it gives the client uh, more certainty uh, around the price. And so rather than waiting until the end and then a bill comes, and that may or may not be a surprise to the client, uh, the client can know with some certainty how much the job is going to cost, how much the work is going to cost uh, for that particular project. Uh, and number three, as well, I think it differentiates the firm. And so if you're looking for some way in which you can stand out from the crowd, uh, offering a price up front before you start would be very, very different from what most accounting firms are doing uh, right now. I think uh, let's not overthink it. It's not too difficult with the tools and systems we put together. It makes it pretty easy. Steve, where are you at with this whole pricing conundrum and since you've gotten started with this process? We are um, my partner and one of my partners and three managers are now working through the pricing power DVDs. Um, we hope to finish them up in two weeks. Um, we have pulled all reference to hourly rates out of our engagement letters with clients. We will be using fixed pricing this tax season. In addition, um, we are um, have an initiative where we are trying to train and have every team member be aware of scope creep and scope seep. And um, so that Whenever a client asks us to do something, we are going to give them the answer if there's a quick answer. But if not, then we need to propose a project to them to actually do the job right instead of trying to be expeditious, give them the quick answer they want. Um, so project pricing is our priority over the next quarter and making sure we identify and price those properly. And the outcome of this, is where your average hourly rate or your net firm's billing rate will increase. As I mentioned before, the average in the United States is $136. Um, ours is $40 on top of that, average. But it ranges up to $522. So your net firm billing rate is, is worked out in the following way. Let's say you have revenues of $2 million and you did uh, 10,000 client hours charged, therefore $200 is your net firm billing rate. Uh, and as you get into pricing strategies, in particular the three areas I'm about to focus you on right now, that will increase. But the increase may not necessarily be from a price increase for the regular year-to-year uh, -year type service. So if you know what your net firm billing rate is, could you put it into the uh, chat? I want to have a little poll here to see what it is if you know what it is. So all client hours for the year into revenue billed for the year, not revenue as part of including WIP. So what revenue has been billed divided by all client hours. This is a number you should know uh, every single invoice, by the way. It's critical to the profitability of your firm. So how are we going to do that? 132 is the first one, right on average. How are we going to do that? How are we going to drive up um, your margin net firm billing rate? Three things, just three. Number one is courage. 
you need to get courage. Uh, it takes a little bit of courage to change the system. But the more courage you get, uh, the easier it is. You know, we have courage pills for you, would you believe? And they are sugar pills, uh, but they give you courage. Uh, so, see, but, so, but to get courage will get you to do some different things. There's no right or wrong price when it comes to pro professional services. It's only what the client's prepared to pay. And particularly when you get into the value belief, value contribution, value perception areas that we talked about a moment ago, uh, you will, 150, thank you, uh, you will uh, have more courage to price appropriately. So you find courage and you develop courage. Number two is where you price every project up front. Every project up front. So you price it up front so the client has um, uh, an engagement letter, uh, a statement of services offered, a, a proposal, implementation plan, whatever you call it, an email to say, this is the work we're going to be doing for you uh, and scope it out. This is the price it's going to be. Please uh, send back uh, your acceptance. And, and until they send back acceptance or payment, you don't start. Because unless you get that price up front, and it has a, you won't get the knock-on effect all the way through uh, to your firm. And the third one is what we've been talking about here is driving time out of the system. So you price up front, you drive time down, and you automatically get um, write-ups rather than write-downs. So your realization uh, margin is, is increased, you know, from the average of 88% to over 100, and you actually get more capacity at the same time as well because you're incentivized to drive time down. Cole, um, what's your experience with these three areas? You know, because we've been talking about this for a long time. We have lots and lots, we have 64 strategies on improving, you know, the, the, the margin, the net firm billing rate. Uh, what do you find with firms, even when they go through our DVD programs, um, you know, which is our Steve says called pricing power, what do you find when it comes to implementation, Cole? Sure. So uh, the, the, the biggest question I get is, uh, uh, take your point about courage, but how do I actually get courage? And uh, the way to get courage is to try something new and then get validation from the client um, that will you know, give you some self-belief in, in, in the change that you're about to make. And so, uh, for example, uh, you know, pick pick uh, ten friendly clients and go to those those people and say, this year we're going to do something different um, that benefits you. And so, instead of you waiting for the end uh, when we finish the work, before we start, we'll give you a fixed price so you've got some certainty, and we know that's helpful for you in uh, in, in difficult times in, in in this sort of economy. Um, and so, uh, wait, uh, and, and then ask the client, how do you feel about that? And I guarantee you that nine out of ten clients, if not ten, will say, that sounds great. That's how you get courage. So try something new, get a positive feedback loop happening, do it again, and then try some more. Uh, next, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, driving time down. It's so important, and Steve, one of the things that uh, that you you mentioned to us was uh, that uh, you put a performance standard in place uh, to turn work around in ten days. Uh, and uh, you know, would it be fair to say that unless you'd really focused on driving time down and, and getting the work in before you start the job, would that have been possible? Not at all. Not at all, Colin. You're exactly right. And uh, I think you know that's that's that, that's really critical. And uh, as we see uh, firms implementing uh, all of these processes, it starts with you. So uh, you know, if you will, the first sale is to yourself. Uh, you've got to believe uh, this. You need to believe that you can take control of this whole process, including pricing and including if you if you if you if you choose when the client pays you as well. And know also, uh, everyone on the line, uh, that uh, we're not making this up. There are hundreds and hundreds of firms who've gone before you and have got super results uh, in, in making these changes. And Carl, I think that's the important thing here, that not only do us on this call have a lot of experience, we're drawing on the little nitty-gritty detail here from what firms are doing, including, okay, what's the letter they send out to introduce us to a client? What's the words you use uh, when a client gives you some feedback that you may not have had before? You know, what, what script, what dialogue do you put in there? You know, how do you, you know, price a value-based fees project, for example? Now, all of this is coming from working with accounting firms every single day. What checklist do we need? You know, based on what we've seen other firms have got courage, 
you know, all coming from accountants in the field implementing this and, and changing and fine-tuning uh, what we're doing. And in fact, I mentioned before that 64 ways to increase um, uh, margin, uh, we also have put into a strategy map, which I do believe, Steve, you've got some copies of this floating around your office, um, which has got so far implemented 484 projects uh, implemented by accountants. Steve, have you, have you got some of these in your office at the moment? Rob, I have one in my hand and I'm looking at it right now, and I have them across all of my offices. Absolutely. So, so this, you, you're the ultimate you know, implementer. I love it. Right? I love talking to people who get things done. So the way you use this map, uh, and it's a big, you know, a big map. I'm not too sure what size. What's about two foot wide, I believe, it's two or three foot wide, and about yeah, two foot deep. That sort of thing. Um, it's split into 10 areas, you know, the top line is all about revenue and profit, you know, a formal equation of leads, conversion, uh, you know, retention rate, average project value, uh, number of projects uh, per client per year, and down here are all the projects associated with that particular item. You know, so a lot of these are pricing, but there's 484 of them in here, you know, capacity for example, people development and structure, equipment, policies and systems. Uh, work in progress and debtors or receivables days. So, uh, Steve, are you, are you crossing these off as you go? Is that the plan? Well, I haven't yet, but I'm certainly using them in making decisions on what we're fixing and where we're going forward. Absolutely. You should never be short of an idea again uh, as a result of doing this. And in fact, uh, I want you to implement these ideas. Uh, that's what it's all about. You, you, unless, like you're learning some things today, uh, Steve's learned what the last 18 months, but unless you implement, this is going to be a complete waste of time. Uh, so I made a promise at the start that you would have um, methods to actually get access to all of this you know, material. And the obvious question is, you know, how do you create these kinds of results in your business? Um, you can either do it slow, uh, and, and do the same things that you've always done effectively and maybe just do a couple of tweaks here and there. Uh, trial and error, you know, you can uh, look at, you know, just look at yourself and give a few, few things um, a try. Or you can get really into it and do it very, very fast and not wait. So I want to talk to you briefly as we start to, um, you know, uh, finalize what you need to put in place for this tax season talk to you briefly about these tools we've been talking about uh, by accountants for accountants. And I've mentioned a couple of things already. i uh, mentioned the uh, efficiency learning system, which we've sold previously for $1,500. Uh, the pricing power learning system, which we've sold previously for $1,500. The uh, workflow process uh, recorded with detail in there for $1,500, sold that separately. Uh, the strategy map, uh, if you'd like a copy of that, we've sold that for $295. And also the, uh, the value pricing system templates, haven't even spoken about that yet, uh, we've sold those for $1,950. So total, uh, $6,745. Uh, what we wanted to do, because we're so passionate about making a difference uh, this tax season, and, and for all tax seasons, is actually make all that available to you for $497. And we're so confident with this that uh, we're going to give you a hundred times return on investment. Uh, we just know this is going to work. With it. We want you to implement this. We want you to make it happen. Uh, if you place an order uh, today, we can get the information to you in the next three to four days uh, in, in by courier, and, and then you can start implementing. And then the guarantee we have, if after implementing this toolkit, you don't achieve at least 50,000 additional profit, then let us know, we'll refund your money and you can keep the product and all of the templates. So uh, our objective with you is to get you to implement somehow, to make a difference somehow. Uh, we want you to be a tax uh, season survivor and make a massive difference. Uh, Steve, uh, you can go to tool for, toolkitforaccountants.com to get it. Uh, we'll get it to you inside a few days. Uh, Steve, this tax season, what are you hoping for uh, as a result in your firm uh, to, to, to make a difference. What do you think is going to happen this tax season for you by making these changes? 
We will actually spend more time with our clients, I will at least, more time with my A clients, providing more valuable services instead of just compliance work. I'm going to provide them a higher level of service and thus a higher rate. So I'll be more productive myself, but I will also have time to do those important things like proposals, um, upfront pricing, um, I'll just have more time to do the important things. I expect profitability to go up. I'll have more time for my team members to um, work on special projects with us. As a matter of fact, I think it's going to be a pretty easy tax season overall for the whole team. It's that as you say, implementing this will create capacity. So I now have to have to figure out what to do with that capacity. It's a nice problem to have, isn't it? It's a very nice problem to have. And we find when firms implement these ideas, the decisions they make are either uh, we refill that capacity with value-added services, we um, uh, downsize the team, we buy firms, uh, we go to a four-day work week. There's many variations that you can do with that new capacity. Cole, for you, uh, what are you hoping for for this tax season for the accounting firms? Well, I hope that, uh, that, that, that the people on the webinar today and uh, ultimately the, the, the profession at large uh, in, in, in the United States listens to what Steve says and uh, in, it, what Steve has proven uh, beyond doubt is that by implementing some simple ideas, it can have a dramatic impact. And right up front, Rob, you referred to my book, uh, Accountants, The Natural Trusted Advisor. And um, my, my hope is that accountants step into that breach. And you cannot step into the breach and become truly valuable to your clients unless, as Steve rightly says, you create some capacity by fixing your workflow, becoming more efficient, pricing up front to drive time down so that you can spend quality time with clients to create value for them. And ultimately, Steve and Cole, that's what it's all about. It's all about serving the clients properly. It's about uh, making sure that their, their needs are met, uh, the services you've provided are in line with their goals. Uh, compliance is becoming a commodity more and more every year with technology. Uh, we must add value. We must be proactive as far as industry goes for us as, a, as an industry to, to survive and to remain relevant. So Steve, I'm thrilled that uh, you've already made a difference and you're taking a step up this second year round uh, and really appreciate your comments, Steve. Uh, really appreciate your enthusiasm for all this, uh, and I love the fact that you've got the strategy maps and you're, you're running through everything, just making it happen. So, uh, Steve, uh, we, we, we track your performance. We're looking forward to seeing more and more of it, and particularly this tax season. And you know, let's hope that what you predicted is actually going to happen. So, Steve, thank you so much for being on this webinar. Well, absolutely. Robin and Colin, the debt of gratitude is from me to you. Um, I, it's made a massive change in my life, and I greatly appreciate it. More than welcome, thank Cole. You, thank you to you. Uh, thank you, Cole, for your contribution again. Uh, looking my forward pleasure, to um, looking forward to an awesome tax season, and more importantly, uh, looking forward to the results that uh, firms get as a result of implementing all this. So, uh, have a fabulous tax season, everyone. Uh, go to toolkitforaccountants.com. Uh, we'll send you an email reminder as well about this if you, if you missed it. But that offer of $497 is valid uh, for the next 24 hours. And uh, certainly we'll get those uh, training materials to you immediately uh, in the next uh, few days uh, so you can uh, start involving your team and making some changes for this year. All the best, everyone, and happy tax season. Bye-bye.